Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Tips, Tricks, and Optimization, a User's Guide to Bond Rx and Chromogenic Multiplexing in Research Applications. I am Kaylee Bach of Labrits, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots and brought to you by Leica Biosystems. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit leicabiosystems.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Mark Lawson, Certified Histotechnologist by the American Society for Clinical Pathology, Field Application Specialist to Life Sciences Lake of Biosystems. Mark, you may now begin your presentation. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, um, so my name is Mark Lawson. Uh, thank you for joining uh, us in this webinar. Um, I'm here to present tips, tricks, and optimization. It's going to be a user guide to the Bond RX and chromogenic multiplexing in the research application. So um, my name is Mark Lawson. I'm an application set specialist on the life sciences team at Leica Biosystems. Um, I provide technical support for the life sciences portfolio, um, including but not limited to the Bond RX, the Bond RXM, and a wide array of, <coughs> a wide, um, array of reagents. So I've worked in the histology field for about 15 years in both the clinical and research spaces. Um, I started off as a histotechnologist and worked my way up to management uh, uh, fairly quickly. Um, so with this experience, I've been able to develop my skills in immunohistochemistry and in situ hybridization assay development, laboratory management, and general histology uh, to a pretty high level. Um, so when I'm not thinking about which primary antibody is best suited for a particular application, um, I like to spend my time with my family and friends. Um, enjoy everything that the North Shore of Massachusetts near my home um, has to offer, and also uh, play a little golf. <laughs> so again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, so this presentation was um, developed for all levels of practitioners, um, but I do assume that you have some familiarity with um, immunohistochemistry and multiplexing technologies. Um, at the end of this presentation, uh, you guys should be able to recall two types of assays that can be run on the Bond RX. Describe two ways researchers can optimize IHC and multiplex staining, and identify one best practice solution for running chromogenic multiplexing. So that is included in the optimization uh, category. Yeah, so let's just go over the basics of immunohistochemistry, just way, go way back to the basics. So again, immunohistochemistry has evolved to complement hematoxylin and eosin and special stain technologies that typically show tissue morphology and structure. Um, while these two technologies are not specific, you know, sometimes they can be specific, but mostly not, um, IHC is directed to a specific protein marker or markers. Um, typically, the chromogens that are used, um, there are two of them. So DAB, which is the brown, and AP, which is the red. Um, DAB is used for most applications. Uh, it provides a strong and permanent uh, stain, you know, with that covalent bond. Um, AP is, is mostly used for skin sections, um, specifically in the clinical world, where DAB may be masked by other brown pigments, such as melanin. Um, for double staining, the, the tradition is to use DAB and AP on the same tissue section. And here you can see that, that construct of, of the primary antibody, secondary antibody, and polymer. In this case, it's horseradish peroxidase uh, with the DAB making that brown precipitate. 
So what's next? Uh, what, what type of technologies are going to be available to researchers uh, to look at these markers and RNA and DNA? So multiplexing allows multiple markers to be stained within a single tissue section. Um, it uses combinations of different markers and chromogens to build a more complete image of the tissue structure. Um, multiplex methods can visualize multiple target antigens, DNA or RNA, within a single tissue sample. Um, you can either do it sequentially or simultaneous, also known as parallel, where you would take, um, you know, uh, maybe up to three different primary antibodies, cocktail them together, um, and come in with the chromogens. Now, the workflow for specifically uh, sequential multiplexing allows for multiple rounds of retrieval and or reagent stripping. Um, it can be used with IHC and ISH in any order, and it can work with chromogenic and fluorescent workflows. So the basic idea is you have your DWAX and retrieval. Um, your primary marker is applied. Your enzyme is applied. So whether it be alkaline phosphatase or horseradish peroxidase, a chromogenic conversion of the substrate happens. And then you add your counter stain, but you can do this uh, doing using multiple rounds. So in a sequential multiplex, you'll do this, um, you know, for instance, for a fourplex four times. Now, wh why are people multiplexing these days? Um, so multiplexing provides new insights into what's occurring at a cellular level. So you can really look at the cellular interactions, learn the functional cell states understand the direct relationship between the DNA, RNA, and protein within the cell, so that translational happening. You can understand spatial arrangements, so are those macrophages close to that cancer cell? You can understand interaction, so is a macrophage interaction, interacting with that cancer cell? And you can really see co-localization, so really dive in to see what kind of immune cells you're looking at. So uh, multiplexing really maximizes the amount of data acquired from a single tissue sample. Um, some popular multiplex applications um, that are used today include PIN4, which is CK5, P63, Amacur, P504S, um, and that's in prostate. Um, a duplex, so kappa lambda in lymphomas. Um, and for melanoma, we have melanase, tyro tyrosinase, HMB45, and CHI67. Now, you know, hi historically, IHC has been performed as a manual process, right? So this can cause a lot of variability in your research project outcomes. Um, you really have, um, you know, various uh, points that you have to control while doing the assay. So independent hands-on techniques. So user to user variability, uh, temperature variability. So you have to make sure that your microwave and your pressure cooker are you know, at the correct temperature at all times. Um, you have your time variability. So you know, you'll see researchers running around with uh, uh, timers on their, on their lab coats. Um, it's a very time sensitive assay. And it also takes time to prepare reagents. You know, never mind that DAB is highly carcinogenic. So if, if you're uh, mixing DAB, it's, it's probably not the safest procedure to be uh, uh, doing. So automation can uh, offer a built-in consistency. Um, it can monitor the sample condition and application. Um, so I, I just want to give you a little bit of a glimpse of the Bond RX. So we'll be talking about the Bond RX in more detail going forward. Um, so in 2011, um, Leica Biosystems released the Bond RX. So the efficiency of full automation is matched to unlimited reagent selection and freely customizable protocols. So you can use any reagent you'd like and develop any type of, re of uh, protocol that you've developed on the bench on the Bond RX. So the Bond 3 from Leica Biosystems was very restrictive. Um, this new Bond RX 
um, offers unprecedented choice with researchers able to select the ideal reagents, dispense sequences, and incubation conditions for a study. Now, just last year in 2021, Leica Biosystems released uh, the BotRx software version 7.0. Um, this software allows you to conduct up to a sixplex sequential staining with IHC ish and IHC plus ish. You can run chromogenic and fluorescent multiplexing in parallel. So you'll have one assay that's chromogenic, one assay that's fluorescent. You can run them at this on the same time at the, on the Bond RX. Uh, you can do up to six instrument mixed chromogens that can be applied to a single slide. So you can purchase a uh, chromogen from an outside company. Um, and the chromogen multiplexing function functionality is supported by some new reagents. So in particular, the blue and green chromogens and also open chromogen functionality, which is uh, using a new detection system. So why is IHC done in research, right? So historically, Western blotting and mass spectrometry, uh, mass spectrometry, sorry, <laughs> I can't uh, really talk today, um, can give a researcher evidence that a particular piece of tissue expresses a particular protein. Now, IHC can determine where in the tissue that protein is found um, the protein can be visualized in this cellular context. Um, therefore, IHC is a tool that can be used in a wide variety of research settings and applications. Um, and these might include oncology, neurology, immunology, diabetes studies, preclinical drug development, toxicology, and pharmaco pharmacokinetics. So getting back to multiplex IHC, um, so what are some issues and questions that arise typically when you're developing a, a multiplex IHC assay? So first off, this is a very long assay in terms of the time it takes to complete. Um, again, reproducibility. Uh, there's that idea that, you know, uh, it's very hard to control each and every uh, part of the assay. Um, some might ask what reagents are needed to perform a chromogenic multiplex IHC assay. And also, how do I optimize chromogenic multiplex uh, a panel? You know, uh, how do I know that my markers are hitting their targets and these chromogens are, you know, really highlighting the antigens of interest? So I want to give you some solutions for these issues um, and, and answer some of these questions. So I wanna introduce the Bond RX, the automated research staining platform that can automate your multiplex IHC assay, uh, really giving that high level of reproducibility. I wanna provide some useful guidance uh, with tips and tricks to set up and run chromogenic multiplex IHC slides on the Bond RX. I also wanna provide sort of a step-by-step -step guide at the slide setup level on how to configure the Bond RX version 7.0 software. And I wanna provide a starting point for chromogenic multiplex IHC panel optimization. So let's get, let's dive right into it. Let's dive right into uh, our user guy here. And again, the purpose of this is, is to really show you some multiplex IHC images to provide some useful guidance on how to set up and run chromogenic multiplex slides and also that step-by-step -step guide on how to configure the Bond RX 7.0 software at the slide setup level. And here's just a presentation roadmap for you. All right, so let's get started with uh, just some general information uh, and guidance, all right? Um, so tip and tips and tricks, right? So as a general rule, uh, the chromogen should always be applied in the following order. So the red chromogen, DAB, blue, and green. Um, the red chromogen is alkaline phosphat phosphatase-based, so you want that to go first because it, it could interact with the HRP 
uh, enzyme reaction. And therefore, if you put the red, for instance, in the second slot, uh, it would be much dimmer than uh, you would expect. So the selection of dehydration procedure is very dependent on the most susceptible chromogen. So um, when you are dehydrating after the slides come off the bond RX, um, you need to uh, keep in mind that the red and green chromogens can be taken through standard dehydration procedures using alcohols and xylenes, but they should not exceed 10 dips or 10 seconds um, so the chromogens will fade and crystallize. Um, and every single one of these chromogens have been optimized to use the Leica Biosystem CV Ultra melting medium. Um, the blue chromogen is not combat compatible with alcohols and xylenes. Uh, you must air dry at room temperature or in an uh, oven at 37 or 60 degrees C. Um, again, you can use CV Ultra. Um, if you're not using CV Ultra, please use a aqueous melted. Um, and again, if the blue chromogen is use, utilized in a multiplex assay, then the stain slide must be air dried. The blue chromogen is photosensitive. Um, you cannot leave it in direct sunlight or uncovered for a prolonged period of time. So BondRx software version 7.0 enables a sequential staining of up to six chromogens in one fully automated run. Um, you do not have to remove the slides from the instrument to achieve this. Um, so any software version prior to version 7.0 do require that the slides be removed from the instrument after the first two detec detection applications. You're going to relabel them with a newly reprogrammed chromogen applicant protocol application protocol, um, and then you return it to the instrument for staining. Um, so it is possible to do multiplexing with any version software prior to 7.0. Um, we do have a new red counter stain, which is optimized for use in conjunction with the blue chromogen. Um, if you prefer a less intense color contrast of hematoxylin or another counter stain, the incubation time can be reduced to three minutes in order to increase the contrast with the chromogen, or you can dilute the counter stain. Um, this is a great tip here. If, if the red chromogen and green chromogen are selected to visualize the target antigens, um, a third purple color, which looks fantastic, will result from co-localization of staining within the same cellular compartment. All right, and this this section is really the uh, my favorite section. Uh, first of all, um, so I'm going to provide a step by step guide on how to set uh, certain multiplex um, assays up at the slide setup screen, and also tell you a little bit about the slide um, and the chromogens and markers that were used. So a little bit of a disclaimer: um, the information here is provided for guidance only. Uh, it does not infer the optimum, optimum usage of the materials. Um, the slide images are provided for information only and were generated as part of product development and have not fully optimized or validated. Um, alternative epitope retrieval steps may yield better results um, and also including blocking and stripping steps may further optimize performance. All right, so here's our first beautiful image. Um, this is with a piece of tonsil tissue using PDL1, CD68, CD8, and PAN CK uh, markers. So PDL1 exhibits in tonsil as a weak to moderate punctuated membranous staining of the germinal center macrophages and a moderate to strong staining of the majority of epithelial uh, crypt cells. Uh, CD68 exhibits in tonsil as a moderate cytoplasmic staining of interfollicular macrophages. Um, like a biosystems clone specifically displays strong cytoplasmic staining of germinal center macrophages. Um, CD8 exhibits in tonsil as membranous staining of the cytotoxic subpopulation of T cells. And PAN-CK exhibits in tonsil as strong staining of epithelial cells. 
so using this combination of immuno-oncology markers, we can reveal details on a tumor microenvironment and uh, can provide sensitive and specific pr predictions on clinical outcomes by assessing the inf infiltration of immune cells, macrophages, and T cells. Um, so PAN-CK exhibits in tonsil as strong standing of epithelial, epithelial cells, again. Um, so as you can see in the slide setup screen, uh, this gives you a breakdown of exactly how this beautiful image was produced on the Leica Bond RX in version 7.0 software. So the first stain, second stain, third stain, and fourth stain. And if you have any questions on exactly how to set these up on your instrument, please contact your local application specialists or reach out to your account, your sales uh, counterpart, um, and they can obviously help you do this. Uh, here we have a colon, um, and we're using CK20, Desmond, CD3, and CDX2. Um, so notes on this. So for, uh, this was scanned on a, a, a like a biosystem scanner, by the way. Um, so for like a biosystems, chromogens have been used on the Barx, Bond RX 7.0 to illustrate the multiplexing capacity of the staining platform. Uh, the chromogens were used to detect four primary antibodies in normal large bowel, as seen in the image limp legend over here and on the uh, left. Um, the two layers of smooth muscle surrounding the bowel is easily visualized with the Leica Biosystems DAB chromogen. Desmond is expressed by the muscularis externa in both the longitudinal and circular muscle. Uh, DAB chromogen detects the anti-Desmond primary antibody, which binds to the tissue expressed Desmond, generating the characteristic brown staining associated with DAB. Within the inner mucosa layer, the muscularis mucosae is also visualized with DAB Desmond complex and the smooth muscle cells among the epithelial cells of the lumen are also visible. A pyrus patch is present in the muscularis mucosae detected using the T-cell markers uh, anti-CD3 and visualized with the lycobiosystem's blue chromogen. The mucosal layer has been stained with anti-CDX2 to show the epithelial uh, goblet cells in the colonic villi, detected using Lycan Biosystems green chromogen and anti-CK20, which is expressed cytoplasmically in the surface epithelial, epithelial cells of the colon and detected using Lycan Biosystems red. So here is, is also a beautiful image of a lung. So um, we're using TTF1, CK5, and Napsin A uh, with our beautiful red counter stain. Um, this is also scanned with a, a like a biosystem scanner. Um, CK5 and T TTF1 are markers used to differentiate adeno adenocarcinomas of the lung from squamous cell carcinomas of the lung. So generally, adenocarcinomas express TTF1 and squamous cell carcinomas express CK5. This image demonstrates a lung adenocarcinoma using CK5, TTF1, and Napsin A, generated using multiplex technology available on the Bond RX. CK5 is expressed by normal squamous cells, such as those lining the bronchus and the bronchioles, leading to the alveolar sacs. Anti-CK5 was used to detect the cytoplasmic expression of the CK5 antigen, resulting in the characteristic brown chromogen staining evident in the bronchiole. In lung, Napsin A is produced by type 2 pneumocytes, alveolar macrophages, and some respiratory epithelium within the cell cytoplasm. Uh, TTF1 is expressed by type 2 pneumocytes and clara cells within the cell nuclei. These two markers can be visualized in different cellular compartments with TTF1 detected with Lycobiosystems red and Napsum A detected using Lycobiosystems blue. blue. <laughs> and again, this is another colon uh, using a fourplex. So 
Um, so some notes on this, uh, the muscularis mucosa is comprised on Desmond expressing smooth muscle cells and visualized with LBS green chromogen. Actively re reproducing lymphoid cells are evident with the Chi-67 biomarker and DAB chromogen, surrounded by mature T cells expressing CD3 and detected with the LBS blue chromogen to form a Peyer's patch. Epithelial goblet cells, which form the mucosal lining of the large bowel express CK20, has been visualized with the LBS purple chromogen. Enterochromatin cells express serotonin. These neuroendocrine cells are present in small numbers in the lamino propria, but are clearly visualized using anti-serotonin antibody and red chromogen. At a higher magnification, dividing epithelial cells forming the bowel lumen are detected by the nuclear express Chi-67 DAB. Migrating T cells are also easily differentiated due to the royal blood blue chromogen color contrasting with the hematoxylin counterstain. Additionally, smooth muscle cells supporting the villi are detected by the cytoplasmically expressed Desmin, visualized by the green chromogen. So again, you can see how this was put together at the slide setup level on the BonRx 7.0 software. So here's the first stain, the second stain, third stain, fourth stain, fifth stain. Um, here is a prostate, also using the red uh, counter stain. Um, this prostatic adenocarcinoma is characterized by the loss of basal cell antigens, CK5 and P40, in the ductal epithelial cells of the prostatic glands. So benign cells tra transform into malignant cells, which express amicur. This is evident using the threeplex technology of the BondRx with LBS chromogens. The non-malignant and malignant ducts are clearly differentiated by the strong cytoplasmic expression of CK5 in the blue in contrast with cytoplasmic expression of amicur detected with the red chromogen. At a higher magnification, the nuclear P40 expression can be seen surrounded by the CK5 blue expression denoting benign cells. And finally, this is just an example of how the red chromogen and the green chromogen can show the cold localized purple. So we have a piece of tonsil staining with um, BCL6 and Chi67 with a hematoxyl counter stain. Um, you can see the little cells uh, with the number one is the red chromogen. Um, that's going to be BCL6. Uh, and number two, which is the green chromogen, which is Chi-67, um, cells undergoing uh, pro proliferation. Um, and again, with the two markers, you get the cold localized purple and three. So here's some information on how to order uh, all of the reagents that you saw in those setup screens. So um, if you have any questions, again, reach out to your local application specialist from the Life Sciences Group, or you can also uh, contact your salesperson. All right, moving on, we're going to talk about some general chromogenic multiplex panel optimization tips. And again, this is just to get you started. I mean, this, this, this process can get somewhat cumbersome. Uh, it's a lot easier chromogenically than it is using fluorescent uh, technologies, but here are some tips that are going to help you. So first off, for cold localized markers, um, consider using chromogens that will create a third color. So again, using that red and the green uh, from like a biosystems, you can produce that purple. Um, if you want to detect multiple proteins that are highly and lowly expressed in tissue, uh, consider using a stronger color chromogen first for the lower expressed marker, followed by the weaker color for the highly expressed marker. This may avoid overpowering the initial stain of the low expressed pro protein. 
Um, so this idea could also be applied if you expect the quantity of one cell type to exceed that of another. So some chromogens convert at different rates. So for instance, you have your red chromogen and what looks like your blue chromogen here. So lots of precipitate equates to a stronger signal. And we all know that red uh, gives you, like a biosystems red gives you a very strong color. So slow precipitating chromogens may prevent this overwhelming signal of other markers. Uh, for spatially close targets, uh, consider selecting chromogen colors for these two markers first. Uh, so run these as dual stains prior to the multiplex panel to select the best color combination. Then address the optimal order for the remaining marker colors. If possible, run these as dual stains prior to the full multiplex panel to select the best color combination then address the optimal order for the remaining marker colors. Um, you also wanna test the stability of different chromogens against subsequent experimental steps. And there are, there are a number of ways to do this. Um, I'm not really gonna go into detail here, but you can ask your local application specialist and also there are many resources. Um, on the internet. Um, so signals that remain strong, use those earlier in the assay and less robust signals later in the experiment. Um, So lighter chromogen colors may be easier on the eyes to visualize. So let's just think of our pathologists here or you know, pri uh, principal investigators, um, especially if you have co-localizations or if you have multiple markers in close proximity to each other. Okay. Um, number seven, DAB can overstain and occlude previously stained um, sites. So all, although DAB is is commonly used, is the most commonly used chromogen for a single stain immunohistochemistry, uh, it's an example of a chromogen that can occlude spatially. So um, if using DAB, optimize the sequence in which it's used to find a suitable place within the multiplex panel. So this is very important. So consider your choice of preferred counter stain with the chromogen colors. Um, half strength hematoxylin, if you'd like it lighter, uh, you can also use methyl green or nuclear fast red. Uh, this is especially true if you're conducting image analysis studies. Uh, teal or blue chromogens may be indistingu ind indistinguishable from hematoxylin counter stain. Um, so you want, may want to try a methyl green or a nuclear fast red, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, also, consider the compatibility of your chosen chromogens with your required or preferred dehydration methods. So again, in the tips and tricks section of this um, webinar, we went over some, uh, some very hard guidelines that are associated with LEGO Biosystems chromogens. So please follow those and consider them when you are dehydrating. Um, so you want to determine which antigens are robust or susceptible to degradation following multiple rounds of antigen retrieval. And you want to consider detecting the susceptible markers earlier in the assay. So there, again, there are multiple ways of testing this out. I'm not going to go into detail now. This is just going to be a starting point for you. Um, you do have um, many resources um, available to you on the internet, as well as uh, I'm sure your colleagues have some tips and tricks that they can tell you. So in summary, uh, 
multiplexing provides a multicolor, multi-target multi slide. It's a permanent stain, unlike uh, some fluorescent assays. It's resistance uh, to photo bleaching uh, is another reason why people might choose this assay over um, fluorescence. And it's great for bright, bright field image and analysis. So you can use image analysis uh, algorithms with some of these assays. So like a biosystems does have a publication repository. So if you want to read some peer reviewed publications featuring the Bond RX, uh, you can head to this link here. I'm sure in the methods section, you can find plenty of great uh, tips as well uh, that may help you along your journey. Um, we also have a new life science portal homepage that was uh, launched recently. So definitely check that out. Uh, we have plenty of, of great uh, resources available um, at this link. So that concludes my uh, presentation. Um, thank you very much for joining me. I'm happy to open up uh, for any questions that you may have. Um, so yeah, please let me know uh, if you have some questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So it looks like our speaker needed to do a quick refresh, so we'll give him just a second to get reconnected back in here. All right, it looks like our speaker was having a few technical difficulties. But he's still trying to get connected here, so we'll give him one more second. Thank you for your patience. There we go. Glad you were able to get back connected in here. Thanks, Mark. Sorry about that. A little technical difficulty. That's okay. We got you now. That's all that matters. Thanks so much. We've got some great questions coming in here from the audience, so we'll go ahead and get started. Our first question asks, what makes the Bond RX unique to the research setting? Yeah, so that's a great question. So Lego Biosystems does have a clinical path platform called the Bond 3, which is very closed. Um, it's an FDA regulated box. So therefore, you know, you really have to follow some strict guidelines. So the Bond RX allows you to open up um, the research platform. So you can bring on any reagent that you'd like, uh, pending it's not too um, acidic or basic. And also you can uh, bring on a, a number of different uh, protocols as well. Great, thank you. Another Welcome. question we have here asks, 
how many chromogenic biomarkers can be stained on one side, or excuse me, slide using the Bond RX? Yeah, uh, another great question. So you can do up to six uh, different biomarkers with six different chromogens. Um, like a biosystems does have four chromogens. So obviously DAB, um, red, uh, green, and blue. Uh, but you can also bring on, uh, you know, outside chromogens uh, that are horseradish uh, peroxidase based. Great. Next question here. On average, how long does a multiplex assay take to stain on the Bond RX? Ah, another great question. Um, so that's highly dependent on the number of the types of steps that you have in your assay. So typically a, a single marker with chromogen uh, takes about two and a half hours to three hours. Um, so you can, you know, depending on how many markers and chromogens you have, uh, can take between three to up to 12 hours. Great. We've got, oh, go ahead. Oh, that's about it. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> got some great questions coming in from our audience. This next one asks, do you recommend using controls for single and or multiplex stains? Oh, 100%. So histology, uh, IHC without controls is, uh, yeah, it's something that I, I highly, highly recommend. Um, always use a uh, positive control and negative control uh, when you are, are optimizing uh, single plex uh, um, uh, markers with your chromogen. Um, I also suggest using it with your with your um, with your multiplex panel. Um, IgG controls, so immunoglobulin G controls uh, will help you understand the background that you're having with your chromogens as well. Um, so I highly suggest using those. Um, yeah. Great. Our next question here asks, how does the red counter stain perform with image analysis software, Halo, Visio Farm, et cetera, for cell segmentation? Ah, this is uh, a little bit outside of my expertise. So I, I do try to focus on the Bond RX. Um, but I, if I were to talk with some of my colleagues um, over in the image analysis um, team um i i from my understanding um it, it works well um although you would probably have to talk to an application specialist on that team um i do know that that those algorithms uh prefer a deep dark purple um although i'm yeah i would have to defer to my uh image analysis uh team great next question here is there a way to dilute the DAB in the kits? Um, not necessarily dilute the uh, the reagent. I would suggest maybe um, trying to um, lessen the time, uh, uh, the incubation time, possibly for the DAB. Uh, there are various ways to reduce the signal as well, such as dilution of the primary antibody or even dilution of your secondary antibody. Um, although if you're using the post-primary in our refined DAB kit, I don't suggest diluting that. Um, so maybe working with the incubation time of your DAB um, and also the dilution of your primary antibody would be the best you know, sort of road to go down. Um, I don't suggest diluting DAB um, from our kit, from our ready to use kit. Great, thank you. Another question we have here is version 7.0 of the software available to those who purchase their Bond RX prior to 2021, or is it additional charge for upgrades? So, yeah, um, I would defer to your sales associate. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, I, I there is a, a, an up. A, a, Upgrade charge, um, depending on what setup you have. Um, yeah, the price could vary. So definitely talk with your sales associate, um, talk with your application specialist, and they can bring you down the correct road. Perfect. Yeah. Another great question we have here. When multiplexing using four or five different chromogen combinations, do your primary antibodies have to be made in different species? This can be challenging. 
Yes, excellent question. Um, so you can use uh, the same species. Uh, so this is a se sequential staining. Um, if you are doing parallel staining where you would cocktail your, your primaries together, um, they will be, half, uh, they will be uh, different species. Although if you're doing sequential, you can use the same species. And I highly suggest optimizing, a, um, having an optimization strategy in which you, uh, you do some stripping steps in between the sequences. So um, you can do, uh, some people do ER1 for uh, 20 minutes at 95 degrees C. Some, you know, it, it's really dependent on the antibody. So you'd have to do a little bit of optimization uh, with that. But yes, you can use the same uh, species. Uh, so the primary antibody was raised in uh, the same species. Yes, you can. Great. We've got time for a few more questions here. So we'll go ahead and continue. This next question asks, can bond RX be used to perform IHC plus RNA scope or DNA scope stainings together? Yeah, excellent question. Um, absolutely. Yep. Um, so we do have an excellent partnership with AD ACD. Um, their application specialists, um, excuse me, can help you with that. Um, it, it was really fine tuned uh, just about a year or two ago, um, but we've we've had excellent uh, staining with with IHC and RNA scope and DNA scope. So yes. Great. Next question, does DAB have a tendency to stain tissue edges in addition to occluding and overstaining? Um, I'm me, um, not necessarily. Um, so are, there are ways to optimize your D DAB staining. Um, that could also be a, a number of different histological issues that may be going on that are uh, prior to going getting on the rx uh, prior to getting onto the bond rx um so that's sort of a complex question i would have to ask a, a couple more questions to to really uh dive down um yeah to give you a better answer um, we can follow up with that perfect thank you Next question here, where can I get this guide that you were referring to today? Yeah, so great question. So, so the guide really was in the presentation. So we, we were just trying to just show you how to uh, really set up multiplex panels on the Bond RX and also give you some, some optimization tips. I think for further uh, down the road, we'll give step-by-step -step guides. Um, yeah, maybe, possibly. Um, you know, please look for that in the future. Um, you can also refer to the website. So we have an actual, actual so our website has um, a, a very, very good um, um, pieces of information that, that will help you out. Absolutely. So please, please, um, you know, further down the road, yes. And also um, our portal uh, for content and how-to guides is excellent. So please refer to the website. Great. Now, earlier we had a question about diluting the DAB in the kit, but this next question asks, can you dilute the counter stains? Oh, yes, absolutely. So if you do have a, uh, a counter stain in a kit, for instance, uh, so a refined DAB kit, you'll have your hematoxylin counter stain. Um, I would suggest putting it in an open container and diluting it. Um, but um, if you would like, uh, uh, you can, yes. Diluting counter stains is, is not a problem at all. Yeah, uh, using using some DI water. Perfect. All right, looks like we have time for one more question here. So we'll go ahead and finish up with this one. And this last okay. question asks, what's the best stripping protocol for a multiplex assay? Ah, yes, it's a, it's a very good question. So um, that is dependent on your uh, primary antibody um, and really the binding uh, that's going on there. Um, so some people will use ER1 for 20 minutes. So that's a citrate buffer for 20 minutes uh, at 95 degrees C. Some people will use ER2 for 20 minutes. I mean, it, like I said, it's really dependent on the primary antibody. So you can um, 
try uh, uh, using controls and optimization tex techniques. So, you, uh, you know, you'll have maybe, for instance, if you have a sixplex, or well, actually I'll make it simpler. If you have a threeplex, you can take your first slide. Um, you can apply your first marker with the chromogen, um, do your stripping step, and then apply in the second sequence, uh, negate your, your second primary antibody. Um, and see if you have, uh, yeah, so, so it's an optimization technique that, that, that you'd have to go through. So I, I, it, it's a little complex. I can go, I'm probably going to put together another, uh, how to guide down the line. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, please look for that in the future, but, um, it's dependent on the primary antibody, the short answer to your question. Great. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap up there. So I want to thank you again, Mark, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Leica Biosystems, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care everyone. Goodbye.